I'm going to talk about invasive insects, but really not invasive insects attacking plants as much as a couple of public health threats that we have uh, moving into the state. So uh, let me start off my presentation. Uh, you know, uh, 10 years ago, I wrote an article for entomologists about 100 years of extension. And, you know, I did a lot of research. Uh, actually, uh, the pictures you're seeing here are some of the uh, early uh, extension trains we had in Kentucky. That's how we got information out across the state. In fact, one of, one of those trains, uh, it, it traveled for 29 days, made 92 stops, uh, and uh, had nine cars. And uh, it, it was great. People came out, they dressed up, and, and they, they came down to see the extension train and, and learn from that. Uh, I also, uh, dur during some of that research, I, I looked into, particularly from an entomology point of view, an insect point of view, what, what were the issues entomologists had to deal with 100 years ago? And I, I, I read a lot of uh, minutes from, from meetings when, when, when people would get together, uh, entomologists would get together, and uh, uh, there, there seemed to be a, a three themes I, I, I pulled out of uh, what they were working on 100 years ago. One was the idea of globalism, so that really hasn't changed. A lot of this was pre-World War I, uh, and, and so the, the, there, there were a lot of uh, concerns uh, that were brewing in Europe particularly. Uh, the, the, the second area was of all things invasive insects that they were concerned about. Now, it was a different uh, host of invasive insects. We were talking about things like boll weevil, alfalfa weevil, uh, San Jose scale, but it was this, this whole uh, similar situation where uh, new uh, pests from other places were moving into the United States, and when they got here, they were creating a lot of havoc. And uh, some of that was the basis for establishing the uh, e experiment or the, the extension system in the United States, particularly with the boll weevil uh, in the deep south. Uh, the third area uh, that they, they were concerned about was just after the start of World War I, and that was uh, food security uh, in particular. So if we look at the um, the situation with invasive insects, uh, it's not a new situation at all. You know, I put together this, this uh, uh, word cloud map uh, just with uh, uh, insects and mites that, that, that came to mind. And you can see there's just a ton of uh, invasive insects. Some of these have been here, you know, upwards of 100 years. Uh, others are relatively new but there is a ton of invasive insects that we have to manage in the United States. You know, and, and one of the questions I get when it comes to some of these invasive insects is, well, do our pests ever become pests in other places? And, and the answer is uh, very much so, uh, that they, they, they can become pests. Uh, probably one of the biggest uh, native pests to, to North America that has gone global has been grape phylloxera, which attacks the root system of non-American uh, uh, grape vines. And that we found out in the uh, 1800s how to graft European grapes onto American rootstocks. And because of that, we were able to save the uh, European uh, wine industry from, from this uh, basically North American pest. But it, it's gotten into Australia and uh, uh, just about all the uh, uh, grape and wine producing uh, regions of the world. Uh, you know, Western corn rootworm, a notorious pest of, of corn in the United States, has moved into uh, uh, Europe and has caused a, a lot of havoc in Southern and particularly Eastern Europe. Uh, the Colorado potato beetle has had uh, 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 issues, particularly in, in Eastern Europe, uh, got a little bit political uh, during World War II, um, where the, uh, the Germans and then uh, later with the Cold War, the, the Russians were, were claiming that uh, uh, we sent them over there to terrorize them because they, they said, even if you look at the beetle, 
the uh, the wing covers on the back look like the stripes on the American flag. But uh, no, this is just a, a, a pest that that happened to get over there. But, you know, more recently, uh, you know, fall army worm in Africa, Asia, Australia, fall web worm in Asia and Europe. I, I hear it's called the uh, American white moth over there, uh, corn earworm in China, uh, even beach scale in Europe. And so this is not just a problem in the United States. It's, it's a worldwide problem with these insects moving into uh, areas where, where they, they haven't belonged in the past. So one of the pests I wanted to talk about, again, this is, is not directly a pest to plants. It can be a pest to plants, but, but it's not. It's more of a public health threat. And that's the imported fire ant. Uh, you know, uh, one, one of the issues that we're dealing with when we try and get information out about uh, imported fire ants in Kentucky is, uh, we talk to a lot of Kentuckians, they say, oh, I grew up playing with fire ants. Those weren't the imported fire ants. So those were other ant species. Uh, a, a lot of people call them fire ants and they're not. Uh, imported fire ants have been uh, uh, a relatively new introduction for, for Kentucky. Um, th there are two species. There's the red imported fire ant. There's the black imported fire ant. And they also hybridize, and we get this red uh, and black hybrid. It's interesting, the, uh, the red is, is what we've seen uh, a little more common in Western Kentucky in the uh, uh, purchase area and the LBL area. Uh, black is, uh, we've seen that again in South Central Kentucky and what I'm going to show you in Eastern Kentucky. And then the hybrid uh, ha has been throughout these areas. And the hybrid is a little bit more cold tolerant. Uh, so uh, what I mean by that is it can survive our winters better than the red or the uh, black imported fire ant. It's interesting when you look at some of the, the maps of, uh, you know, where the USDA was predicting fire ants could, could move in and you look at some of the older maps, uh, they excluded Kentucky. We, we were considered too cold for fire ants. And so th this map I'm showing you right here is, is clearly out of date. Uh, uh, when we look at uh, where fire ants have uh, established. So um, here's a map. This, this is uh, South Central Kentucky. This is where I-75 exits Kentucky uh, on, its, on the way to uh, Knoxville. So this is the Daniel Boone National Forest, uh, Southeastern Kentucky. Uh, last February, we got a call of fire ants. We went out there, we confirmed they were fire ants. We treated them. Uh, we thought it was a one-off thing. Someone had brought in some uh, pine mulch from, from Tennessee, uh, but then he found uh, colonies on his neighbor's property. The county agent in uh, uh, McCreary County had put a Facebook out and we started getting, you know, someone would say, well, I found two mounds on my uh, uh, seven acre pasture. We would go out there and we'd find 80 mounds on his pasture and it just started snowballing and snowballing. Then we started getting reports in uh, Whitley County as well. And then uh, I was down there one day and I said, hey, those look like fire ant mounds just on the side of the road. We stopped and we found dozens more mounds, even in places where they weren't being reported. And so th this short, sort of shows you a map of the situation in, the, in those counties. The, uh, the, the flame icon is where we have established fire ant mounds. The, uh, the sort of tented uh, icon is where we've put out and we've been trapping for them and we haven't found them. So we're trying to delineate exactly where, where fire ants are occurring. You know, why is this important? Because uh, they are a public health threat. They, they, they stress livestock. They can cause anaphylactic reactions in some people. Uh, they, they, they reduce enjoyment of being outdoors for people. Uh, that work outdoors, uh, th th they're much more prone to uh, getting stung stung by these fire ants. So, uh, you know, if you look quickly at, the, at this, this map, uh, you can see that uh, uh, we have an area of about uh, 250 to 280 square miles uh, that look like the fire ants have become established. You know, fire ant mounds, uh, you, th you think you, you know what they look like, uh, they tend to be these, these raised dome mounds. 
but uh, when you go out there and you, and you look at lots of mounds, they can have a lot of different types of forms. This is this happens to be one uh, on a roadside that probably doesn't get much higher than a third of an inch in height, but there's a lot of fire ants underneath that. This is what a typical mound structure looks like with the fire ant. You get this dome-shaped mound. Uh, I joke and jokingly uh, refer to them as solar powered. And the reason is that they make this large dome to uh, capture heat. It warms the colony. Uh, the domes are larger in the spring and in the fall. In the summer, they, they don't raise them up as much because they don't need that heat. Uh, there, there's an above ground portion. Think of it as an iceberg above uh, the, 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 the sea. Uh, and, and then there's a much larger portion uh, below ground. And that below ground portion can range anywhere from 12 to, to 30 inches in depth. There tend to be some uh, below ground foraging tunnels. These are protected tunnels they use when they're going out and uh, raiding other colonies, collecting food, things like that, where they're protected. Uh, below the colony, there, there are some tunnels that will go down uh, to uh, the water table so they can collect water. But what you have in the, the, uh, the nest chamber itself is this, this honeycombed uh, a nest, and, it, and it's very strongly honeycombed. Uh, some people have uh, 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 turned this into artwork. What they do is they pour molten aluminum into a fire ant colony, and they, they, they let that molten aluminum uh, solidify, and they dig it out, and they wash out the soil, and you see what they get. It's, they get these, uh, these uh, uh, ant artwork colonies, and what I did is I, I flipped one upside down because that's the orientation it would actually have in the soil. And so you can see that forging tube there on the right, and you can see that that conical nest that goes uh, quite deep in, into the ground. So uh, we, we, there are single queen and multi-queen colonies. Uh, what we think we've seen only in Kentucky are the single queen colonies. Uh, there, there are multiple queen colonies, and when that genetic form shows up in an area, you can get much higher densities of fire ants uh, within an area. Uh, you also get colonies that live much longer. A uh, single queen colony, when the queen dies, the colony dies. With a multi-queen colony, there's a succession plan with it. Uh, only five colonies, or five counties in Kentucky, or Tennessee, I'm sorry, have multi-queen colonies. Uh, so that 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 is uh, one, one issue. Uh, so how how fire ants work is that uh, you know the, as the colonies develop, they they pr produce winged reproductives. Uh, they send these individuals out, they mate, and they start new colonies. Uh, one thing we've observed is uh, they're doing this year round in these areas where they've become established. Uh, we went out the week after that big freeze after Christmas, and the colonies survived, and they had winged individuals ready to go out even in, in the, uh, the first days of, of January. Uh, what they do is they usually send these individuals out a few days after a soaking rain. Uh, they fly generally within about a mile and a half, and so that's the typical spread you can see but some of them can travel up to, to six miles. And the, the single queen females fly farther than the multi-queen uh, individuals. So, you know, I showed you that map and you had those flames and you think those flames are individual colonies. This is what one of those uh, flame icon looks like. This is about a hundred feet across uh, th this map. And it just shows you the number of colonies, uh, established colonies we, we can have within these areas. Uh, what we do to monitor for fire ants is we put out these uh, one inch sections of uh, uh, hot dogs. Uh, we leave them out for about uh, a few hours. We go back and we collect them and we identify the ants on them. Uh, they are uh, very effective tools for uh, quickly sampling for uh, fire ant colonies. We, we have found them on the hot dogs when we cannot find the colonies that they are coming from. So th this is uh, the map. Uh, our strategy is going to try and contain them within this area. 
We do have some colonies that have gotten out of the containment area where we are treating those and we're going to try and knock them back. Uh, but we uh, we cannot eradicate them where, where they are truly established. Uh, you know, worldwide, once they become truly established, uh, no one's really been successful in eradicating uh, fire ants in, in some of these places that uh, they have hundreds of millions of dollars more than we have available to us. What the reason why I'm talking to you about this is if you see fire mounds, and this is a typical mound, it's, it's about uh, eight to 10 inches in height, very fine soil, no obvious funnel to the top of the mound. Uh, if you see something like this, uh, take a picture of it. Uh, so see it, click it, and send it to your county agent because we need, need you to report these uh, so we can go out and we, we can confirm whether or not they're fire ants, and if so, if we need to treat them. I mean, just, just this morning, uh, we got a report uh, 10 miles further north than we, we knew that they uh, had been reported before. Last week, we had a report in a south central colony or county. Uh, the week before that, it was uh, out in the, the purchase area, so, some, some other uh, mounds. So there's a lot of activity going on with, with fire ants. The second pest I wanted to talk to you about was the Asian longhorn tick. This is a, a new tick species. I don't think there are any fans of ticks within Kentucky. Uh, this is an Asian species that was first uh, reported in New Jersey around 2015. Uh, what you're looking at are females. There are only females of this species. That, that's one of the reasons why this is so problematic. Uh, this species does not need to mate. It's parthenogenic. So a female can lay thousands of eggs and all those eggs are gonna be more females. And what we're talking about is, you know, 1,200 to 3,000 eggs uh, per female. This is sort of a map, you know, it was first reported in, uh, in New Jersey in 2015. It has spread to slowly to a number of states, but in, including Kentucky, where we've had uh, uh, nine Kentucky reports. Uh, there's a few more counties. Uh, I don't know if those county names have been officially re uh, released or not, but there's a few more in, in central Kentucky where, where uh, we, we have confirmed that there are uh, fire ants out there. And they're, they're, they've been found on a variety of different animals. This is a map. Uh, this was generated uh, to try and uh, determine what areas would be best suited for this uh, new invasive uh, tick. And the darker the red color on the map, the more conducive the area is uh, theoretically to this uh, Asian longhorn tick. And so you look at Kentucky and it's completely inside that area that looks like it's very, very uh, the ideal habitat for, for this tick. And so that, that's one reason why it's a concern, but there, there are other concerns as well. This gives you an idea of when you see the ticks during the year. So uh, they go through uh, four life stages. There, there are eggs that are laid in the fall. Uh, the eggs hatch and they turn into the young larva. That's that blue line. And you can see uh, the, the, the larvae can be found from late July uh, through the frost of November. Uh, if, if the ticks read the book, that would be the only time of year we would see them. But, you know, uh, in Pennsylvania, they are noticing a small population of larvae again in, in the late spring. Uh, af after they take a blood meal as a larva, uh, they, they drop off the host, they molt and they become a nymph. And you can see the nymph is what we see in the early spring through uh, early summer. And so that's a larger uh, stage. You know, the larva has six legs, the nymph has eight. And then after the, the nymph takes a blood meal, drops off, it molts and it becomes an adult. And you can see the adult is gonna be more of a late summer uh, tick. So these are what the different stages uh, look like. Uh, again, just like aphids, uh, they, they reproduce what we call asexually. They don't have to mate. Uh, and one reason why I consider that a problem is now you have 100% of the individuals in the population that are laying eggs. You know, if you had males and females, 
uh, possibly only 50% of the population uh, was, was laying eggs. And so they have the ability uh, to increase in numbers very quickly. Oh, sorry. And th this, this just shows you, uh, this is out of Rhode Island, uh, how people can uh, pick up you know, very large numbers of ticks. These are the larvae. Uh, they hatched from an egg mass. They, they climb up on weeds. Uh, they quest. That's where they, uh, they wait for a, uh, a mammal uh, or, or another host to come by. Uh, when they brush up against the, uh, that, that cluster, you know, they latch on and then, then they, they can begin their, their feeding. And, you know, that doesn't, may not look that bad with a single um, uh, weed, but the person who took this photograph said there were dozens of, of weeds just within this area that had these questing larvae on them. Uh, this, this tick has a wide host range. Uh, people, uh, people are not preferred, but, but we have had some uh, ticks off of people, but uh, uh, lots of other wildlife, uh, livestock, and pets. Are, are very susceptible uh, to infestations and feeding by this tick. So uh, until recently, no disease transmission has been reported in the US. That changed last year when they found uh, that it was transmitting a protozoan called uh, Tularia orientalis iketa. Uh, th this is a very serious bovine uh, disease of livestock that causes a, an acute anemia. Uh, and uh, ha has killed uh, a number of livestock uh, on its own, even in the absence of, of this uh, protozoan, which can cause this disease. There have been cases of exsanguination of livestock where enough blood has been pulled from sheep or other livestock uh, to cause their death. They basically bled to death from, from the ticks feeding on them. So uh, th th this is a, a very serious problem. In terms of protecting yourselves when you go out to your farms and you're working on your farms, things like that, uh, the CDC has a great website where, where they show the, the different materials that can be used to protect yourself from, from ticks. Uh, they, they rate those in terms of the number of hours of protection. So things like DEET, which I consider to be the gold standard, some people don't like DEET. There, there are a number of alternatives uh, that are out there. But again, if you, if you see this tick, if you're seeing ticks that, that look different uh, or are causing problems to, to pets and livestock, uh, you can always uh, pull them off, uh, send them into your extension office and uh, uh, see if we can get them identified for you. 